majority Tamil populations. Since 1983, the Tamils have waged a bloody guerrilla war for an independent homeland called Elam, which the Sri Lankan army has countered with frequent brutality and wanton killing. Over 5,000 people have died and some 300,000 have become refugees. In the meantime, attempts by India to negotiate a peaceful solution have seesawed between imminent success and impending failure. But last week's massacre of Sinhalese, said by the government to be the work of Tamil guerrillas, and the Sri Lankan Air Force's retaliatory strikes may finally have killed off all hopes for peace. So just what are the full implications of the recent killings? And what now are the prospects for a negotiated settlement? With me are four gentlemen who should have the answers. In London, Ravi Sundaralingam, a member of the General Committee of the Tamil Guerrilla Group, the Elam Revolutionary Organization, Sivakumaran Satyamurthy of the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, the biggest guerrilla organization, and Humphrey Hawksley, the BBC World Service's former Sri Lanka correspondent. Whilst on satellite from Colombo, Lalit Athulath Mudali, Sri Lanka's Minister of National Security and the man with immediate responsibility for the island's communal conflict. Let me start with you, Mr. Athulath Mudali. Your government has blamed the Tamil guerrilla groups for both the Good Friday massacre as well as Tuesday's bombings in Colombo. What evidence have you got for this? We have blamed the LTTE for the massacre near Trincomalee. Eyewitnesses, survivors, have identified members of the LTTE who were responsible for this. There's other evidence as well. The leader of the massacre group was a man by the name of Pulendiran. As far as the Eros uh, bomb attack in the city of Colombo, we have evidence of a technical nature, evidence of some survivors, and we have certain other evidence upon which we are working. All right, let me come and to you. Sorry, carry on, mister. Carry on, mister. No, and uh, the previous bomb attacks in the city of Colombo uh, in the last year were all done by the EROS, and most of those people who carried out those attacks have been arrested and are to be indicted in the High Court of Colombo. All right, let me put that to you, Ravi. The minister has said he has evidence. Do you accept EROS' responsibility for the Tuesday bombing in Colombo? Obviously, you don't expect minister to say anything other than that. Uh, first of all, uh, let us make it clear. Euros has already put out a statement, not only denying the responsibility, uh, responsibility, but also condemning such an atrocity. This is something we want to make it clear to the British audience or any other audience who, who watches this program. And second thing is, if people don't believe in, uh, uh, in a statement like that, we have to look into the nature of the attack and who would have perpetrated it to see who benefits out of it. If Eros couldn't have done it for two simple reasons. First of all, Eros is not a narrowly defined nationalistic organization. It, it, is, uh, uh, it is part of a world movement for workers' emancipation. That means we are uh, always thinking the single is working masses as our brothers and sisters. So any act such as this, which alienates further and further away these forces of progress, would be not the workers' heroes. Second of all, I want to make another point. If you take the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, aftermath of this bombing itself, the Colombo bombing, it has put pressure on uh, the Sri Lankan government. At the same time, it has put pressure on the militant groups themselves. No militant group in their sane mind is going to put pressure on themselves by self-inflicted acts or something like that. Because in, in the uh, world uh, media itself, it has given the government an opportunity to wage a war on the Tamil minority. Minister, no guerrilla group in its sane mind would take this action. How do you counter? Well, the simple thing is that when Eros did last year's bombing, they issued the same kind of statement. But the people arrested for last year's bombing all admit that they were involved and that it's part of their program not to take responsibility for these things. And the, even the bombing here, the people who are being arrested will show very quickly that they were all members of EROS or allied group LTTE. Sati, the minister also blamed the Tamil Tigers for what's happened on Friday, the Good Friday massacres. 
How do you reply? LTT has denied any responsibility to the killings in Trincomalee or the bombing in Colombo. And uh, <coughs> it is a total lie on the part of the minister to say that they have identified the uh, leader of the group as Pulendrat because we know minister is in custody. One of the uh, one of our commanders, uh, particular commander Aruna, and they couldn't identify him as an LTT commander, and subsequently he, they exchanged it for two of their soldiers. And it is a total fabricated lie meted out by the minister and his government. And furthermore, saying that they are arrested people. It is well known that they are arresting people yeah. or, and, and torturing them and extracting evidence against them. All right, so I think it is all fabricated lies. That is what we would say. All right, we have two very clearly opposed positions here. Humphrey, now you've been a former correspondent in Sri Lanka. Do you accept, as the minister has said, that the guerrillas have responsibility for the recent killings? I don't think we're ever going to know 100% who did it. This debate is going to go on and on. But what's your inclination? My inclination is that it was part of the Tamil movement that did it. The reason being is that last year the Eros group did claim responsibility for at least two of the three major bombings in Colombo and civilians were killed in that. The, the casualty figures and the brutality here is much higher but, uh, but it was a, a, a bomb attack in a, in a capital city. All right, let's move on then, Minister. Your armed forces have in the meantime launched aerial strikes against Tamil areas in the north. Now, is this revenge or is it the beginning of a military solution? No, neither. But this what, is, but what if I may go back to the earlier statement, the Trincomalee killing, the LTT leader Pulendran and some others also belonging to the LTT were identified by survivors and eyewitnesses, not by me. Uh, the, as far as the action we have taken in the north, we have said very clearly, we have come to the conclusion that the LTT and the Eros do not want a peaceful solution. And we have decided to attack the LTT and Eros targets only in the Jaffna Peninsula. And the Sri Lanka TV showed last night what those attacks were. I th can you still hear us, Minister, or has the satellite now gone down? Uh, well, I can hear you clearly. What I then, don't what see you then, actually. What but then, look, I think what then Minister, Minister, were you saying was the aim of the strikes? The aim of the strike is to destroy the LTT and Eros targets in the north. Uh, because we have come to the conclusion that these two groups, we're not talking about other groups, these two groups are not interested in a peaceful solution. In that case, how long will these strikes continue? Well, that's a matter I cannot tell you, because that's a purely military question, which is really dealt with only by military commanders. Well, you said your aim is to eliminate the camps of these two Tamil groups. Given that you don't actually have presence on the ground in the area, how will you know when you've done the job? No, we have a presence on the ground and we have taken aerial photographs and ordinary people of Jaffna have given us information and we have struck not only their bases but their munitions factories, supply bases and such things. Would and, you by say, would you say? and by intercepting their telecommunications, as we are capable of doing it, we know that we have struck the correct targets. You say you have a presence on the ground. Do you therefore plan to use ground forces to supplement and add to your aerial attack? Well, at the moment, no ground forces have been used to supplement the aerial attack. Do you want to retake the Jaffna Peninsula? I don't quite see it like that. This is the territory of Sri Lanka, and we have to take steps to try and ensure that the Sri Lanka stays as one country. But we have not closed the door for a peaceful political settlement. According to some reports that have been received in this country, perhaps up to some 300 innocent Tamil civilians have been killed as a result of your aerial strikes. How do you defend your government against their deaths? That is not true. We had warned the civilians not to be near these bases. Many civilians left. And even the Madras paper, the Hindu, which is well known to be pro-terrorist, has put the figure of dead civilians as less than 20. But are you saying, in fact, that that is the only number of civilians killed and that the figures that we've received here of two, three hundred are now false? Two, three hundred, I believe, are the normal disinformation, exaggeration of terrorist propaganda groups. Well, let me then come to you, Sati. What is the correct figure of Tamil civilians killed as a result of these strikes? Before going to that, I want to make uh, a reservation on the comment made by uh, uh, Humphrey. Uh, <coughs> actually, there are certain subversive elements 
within the single constituency and certain sections of the government, they are responsible for these killings in uh, Trincomalee and the incident in Colombo. Fine. And Can we come back now to yes. the question of the civilian deaths? Do you accept that only 20 have been killed and not two or 300? No. <coughs> there are more, more than hundreds, 200 people, over 200 people have been killed. And furthermore, I want to make a, a point clear. The minister, the minister said that he is willing to negotiate. But it is not true. They are pursuing a military pursuit. They have unleashed aerial bombardment, naval bombardment, shellings on the civilian targets. O he or, are, they are going on an all-out war or at, Sati, on, on the civilian population. Not even, not a single base of uh, LTT was uh, affected. We didn't suffer any casualties, but the civilians suffered casualties. And minister is totally distorting the picture. And furthermore, he has denied uh, Sati, the, let the me take denied up your, access. Let I me take I, up your idea for a negotiated yeah. solution with the minister while we still have him and the satellite. And before I do that, Minister, can I ask you, given your statement that you're facing a terrorist situation, are there immediate things that you would like the Indian government to do to help your government in Sri Lanka? Well, there are many requests we have made of the Indian government. Our main request in the past has been for them to stop tolerating these people in India because they are breaking Indian law. For example, Indians are not allowed to move around India with pistols in their pockets, while these people have been allowed to do so. We have requested India a number of times to prevent men and materials being allowed to come from India to Sri Lanka because, as we know, weapons and ammunition have come that way. Let's talk about the prospect of a peaceful solution, Minister, a negotiated settlement. Do you still see a future for the Indian mediation? I hope so. I see a future for mediation all the time. We have done our best. In fact, before the massacres at Trincomalee and uh, bomb explosion in Colombo, we offered a unilateral cessation of hostilities. We were prepared to take further steps to cool the situation down. But unfortunately, we met with an attack which shows clearly, as far as the LTT and EROS are concerned, killing civilians has become a part of their policy. All right, you're leaving open the door for a negotiated solution, but your Prime Minister, Mr. Prema Dasa, said in Parliament on Friday that negotiations were suspended until peace was restored. What did he mean? But I was uh, present at the time he made his speech. I don't think that is a true import of what he said. What he did say was because the LTT and EROS are attacking civilians in this way, the steps to protect the population must gain priority. But are you still interested in negotiations and prepared to talk to the Tamil guerrilla groups? We have never said no and we do not intend to close any doors. All right, the LTT all right. and EROS seem to be bent on trying to get a military victory for themselves. Well, before I come to LTT and EROS spokesmen who are with me in London, can I ask the Indians say that the reason they suspended their peace initiative in February was because your government had reneged on the so-called December 19th proposals in which you had agreed to a certain measure of provincial autonomy and to two separate but interlinked Tamil provinces. What is your position now on the December 19th proposals? Well, the December 19th proposals, the President has made it very clear at the end of February. But we are now in a situation where both the LTT and EROS have rejected the December 19th proposal. And Wait. the Indians are trying to persuade them to accept it. And even yesterday, the LTT leaders were, some of them were in Delhi. And we know from Delhi that the LTT has rejected all these efforts by India to bring them to the negotiating table. Before I put that to the LTTE spokesman, can I confirm, does, does your government accept and reconfirm its acceptance of December 19? The position of the government of Sri Lanka on all proposals, including that of December 19th, have been clearly stated by the President in, in his statement to Parliament in February. Since then, negotiations had begun. The Indians had made some kind of effort. So there is no need to reassert the obvious. But the, the obvious being that you do accept the proposals? The obvious is that the LTT have rejected the December 19th proposal, and there's nothing more we can do with it at the moment until the LTT's intransigence is changed. All right, Humphrey, very quickly to you before I go to LTTE. The minister seems to be prevaricating. 
Does his government accept the proposals or not? I think the government's got to look and see what the majority Singhalese community is doing about it because it's a very sensitive issue. If it comes out and says it accepts them, there might be a, a, an opposition backlash against that. So the government is worried about its Singhalese flank? I think at the moment it just wants to have it all in suspension until the violence has died down a bit. But for the time being anyway, Sati, the government's position is that you, the Tamil Tigers, have rejected the December 19th proposals. Is that true? You know, LTT has always made it clear that it is committed for a political settlement. It is the Sri Lankan government which has frustrated India for the last four years yes. in all its effort to... Sati, to, to the point to, though, yes. do you accept the December 19th proposals as a Tamil Tiger spokesman? Actually, the so-called December 19th proposal, the details of the such proposal is not communicated to us officially either by the Sri Lankan government or Indian government. So you have not rejected them? Actually, the, you know, our position is, right, we are prepared to negotiate a settlement which will bring justice to the Tamil people, the, that is, ensure security, dignity. All and right, let me bring you in at this point then, Ravi. What is the Eros position on the December 19th proposals? No, first of all, well, let us make a few points clear to the minister. First, he says, uh, and first of all, uh, to Humphrey's point, that Viros has done about 15 operations in Colombo. No, so, Ravi, I must casualties. insist, we really Fair have enough. to stick to the point. Do you accept the December 19th proposals as an Eros spokesman? Eros has always agreed that December 19th can be a starting point for any negotiation. It is, in fact, the government which is vacillating on this point. When you say a starting point, do you hope to build on top of it? Of course we do, because that uh, we stand by the four principles we set out in the Timbu talks. That is uh, the whole exercise, the Indian mediation, the good offices India has provided to build that in, uh, in, Kala, in Timbu was the four points which you consider as the freedom charter of our people. All right, Minister, the Eros spokesman has said that they will talk. They consider December 19th as an effective starting point. What's your reply? Well, that, is, that has been their position. That is correct. Not only they, but PLOT, TELO and EPRLF are more or less holding similar positions. Our knowledge is that LTT, as even evidenced by the person in front of you, have rejected it. In fact, the LTT in Sri Lanka, whom I have some contact with, have told me categorically that they do not accept December 19th because from their point of view, it means a part of their homeland is removed. Yes, but Eros says that they are prepared to begin talks on the basis of December 19th. Are you prepared to offer them at those talks further concessions on which a negotiated settlement can be built? Our position on December 19th was very clear that if it was the matter which concluded the matter, then the President of Sri Lanka would convince the government and people of Sri Lanka and the Parliament of Sri Lanka to go ahead with it. Up to now, this has not been possible mainly because the LTT categorically rejects it. So you're not prepared to offer more than December 19th to encourage Eros to talk to you? Well, that is a different question. Eros is not the only uh, thing in this whole problem. Unless everybody is prepared to talk, you can't talk with some people on some basis, while the other waits on the side and doesn't talk to you at all. If talks begin, it must begin with everybody. Minister, it's often said by some of your colleagues in Colombo that one way of breaking the logjam, if they may use that phrase, is if Rajiv Gandhi were to put pressure on the Tamil guerrillas. Do you, as Minister of National Security and Deputy Defence Minister, believe that Rajiv Gandhi has the influence to put such pressure for that purpose? Well, I don't think I am competent enough to talk to you about the internal political power structure in India. But I can certainly say that we believe that if India applied the law that applies to Indians on these people of Sri Lanka who are living in Tamil Nadu state, then a lot of things would begin to change. Humphrey, does India have that influence? And quickly, if it does, will Rajiv exercise it? It's losing its influence and very fast, mainly because the guerrilla groups are becoming more self-contained and we're seeing them being less and less reliant on India. And, I'm sh and the policy in Delhi at the moment is wavering and has been for some time because Mr. Gandhi has political problems of his own. In the light of what Humphreys just said, Minister, is the Indian mediation now, although you say it's on the card still, a receding hope? Well, I'm not an astrologer. I hope not. What's your personal position? Do you believe that a 
negotiated settlement is possible in the foreseeable future? In my view, I can't go on a time scale. A negotiated settlement is the way out for this kind of problem. But when you are faced with intransigent groups, you have no alternative but to use some military force to defend yourself. But I still hope that the door to a negotiated settlement will not be closed. Even if that military force which you're using appears to other people to be closing the door? Well, I think people who matter know that that is not the object of the military exercise. Humphrey, what's your position? Do you think peace is attainable in the foreseeable future, a negotiated settlement? No, not for several months at least. I don't think we're going to see talks at all. And do you think that the exercise that the minister and his government are carrying out will make the situation worse, or will it improve it as the minister hopes it does? I think we're seeing another cycle, but the military has gained some successes this year, so we might see a weakening of the guerrilla groups on the ground. And there, gentlemen, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Minister and Colombo, gentlemen here in the studio in London, thank you very much for joining me. Well, that's it for part one. We'll be back after the break to talk about democracy in Argentina. See you in a moment. World in Action tonight reports from Sri Lanka on the human suffering on an island at war with itself. A helicopter gunship patrols Sri Lanka's war zone. For two years, this territory was in the hands of Tamil rebels. In the last few weeks, it's been brought back into government control. 4,000 troops stormed the Vadamarachi Strip under cover of naval guns, bombing raids and artillery fire. It was uh, to establish law and order in this uh, area of Vadamarachi. As you know, it was terrorist control for a long time, and that is the birthplace of terrorism. In Sri Lanka. This is Operation Liberation, so-called because the government says it's rescuing its people from the grip of terrorists. But evidence is growing that it was civilians, not terrorists, who suffered most in the onslaught. Tonight, World in Action reports on the civil war that is tearing a tropical island apart. Broken <laughs> water and on the government which is accused of bombing its own people in the name of their freedom. The heart of Colombo, capital city of Sri Lanka. The majority of people here are Sinhalese by race, Buddhist by religion. The island won independence from Britain without bloodshed and its people like to think that theirs is still a peaceful society. But here at the Petar bus station, that illusion was blown apart. On April the 21st this year, 107 people died when a car bomb devastated the crowded terminus. This carnage in the capital brought home the ferocity of a civil war which has been dividing the nation for 15 years. Sri Lanka is a country of two races. The majority are Sinhalese who believe the country has a sacred place in the Buddhist religion. The minority are Tamils, Hindus who came from nearby India over the centuries. Today, they make up just one-fifth of the island's people. But 50 million more Tamils live across the narrow pork straits in India. This huge presence has long been seen by Sri Lanka's Sinhalese as a threat. They believe, too, that Tamils prospered too much under British rule. So laws were passed favoring Sinhalese language and culture at the expense of the Tamil minority. Well, the roots of the Tamil problem arise from the inability governments after Sri Lanka achieved independence in 48 to work out the constitutional foundations of a plural society. In 1956, we enthroned Sinhala as the only official language of this country and thereby made the Tamils feel that they were second-class citizens in the country of their birth. More recently, the concerns have been with regard to education and employment and more deeply, 
largely as a result of the recent events, their concern about personal security. Since independence, Tamils have suffered increasing attacks on their property and their lives by mobs of militant Sinhalese. The first attacks happened in the 1950s, but they became much worse in 1977 when thousands were made homeless, businesses were looted and scores raped and murdered. In 1983, the violence peaked in bloody massacres, which took as many as 1,500 lives and led 100,000 Tamils to flee abroad, to India and Europe. In the 1970s, Tamil leaders started to demand a separate homeland for their people. It would be called Elam and would take in the northern region around Jaffna and the eastern province around Trincomalee and Batikaloa. Elam became the rallying cry for the growing bands of young militants. When Tamil MPs adopted the idea, they were banned from Parliament. This was a, a folly, a fatal mistake on the part of the government of Sri Lanka, because what it in fact did was to drive the moderate elements outside the formal political arena and deny to the Tamil community effective political representation so that their grievances could be articulated through constitutional means. As a result of this, we have had the armed struggle emerging in the forefront of the ethnic confrontation and all other democratic forces being progressively marginalized. The most successful of these armed groups are the LTTE, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam. The Tamil Tigers claim a fighting force of 5,000 men and women, well trained and well armed. They operate throughout the disputed northern and eastern provinces. The tiger fighter is a dedicated young man who feels that his people are facing genocide and who feels that he has to defend his people from being liquidated by state terror. How determined are they? Their commitment is symbolized by the fact that they carry cyanide pills. The cyanide pills are used when they are cornered or when they are about to be arrested by the enemy. They would prefer to take their life rather than revealing any facts or information regarding our movement. The Sri Lankan government sees the Tigers in a less romantic light. They hold them responsible for hundreds of deaths, like these Buddhist novices hauled from a bus and murdered at the beginning of this month for the bus station bomb and for the deaths of Sinhalese settlers in the areas Tamils claim as their own. To the government, they're ruthless gunmen who have balked at every peace proposal. The militants have been always rejecting those proposals and in the meanwhile, creating a situation in Jaffna Peninsula particularly and in some parts of the eastern province where they were systematically eliminating ruthlessly anybody who opposed them. If you don't support them, you get eliminated. It's as simple as that. And uh, where the uh, process of punishment is by hanging people by a lamppost, where they forcibly go into houses and say, give us your jewelry for the cause. And where they tell uh, families, you have got one child studying, hand over the other to fight with us. There isn't very, very much options left. That is not the system that we stand for. Not everybody agrees with this picture the government paints of the Tigers. This is Pulovi, one of the northern towns the government says it liberated in the recent battles. Here, people were afraid to speak, but those who talked to us in private refused to condemn the Tigers. To many moderate Tamils, the reasons are clear. I think uh, in the process of an armed struggle, an armed confrontation of this nature, there is a uh, considerable emotional identification of the ordinary people uh, with those whom they see defending them and willing to sacrifice their lives for the defense of the people. They see this as a confrontation between the state and the people of that region. And uh, the militants are seen as being on the side of the people, clearly. If we are not supported by our people, we couldn't have existed as a guerrilla movement. You've never been elected to represent the Tamil people. What gives you the right to say you do so? It is because we have been fighting for our people. We have been sacrificing our life for our people. We are sharing their suffering and agony. So we have become the part of the suffering masses. 
once a democratic process is instituted, once an election takes place, of course we will stand for election. And of course we will be legitimately elected as a representative of our people. But as you know, there's no political process, there's no political institutions, democratic process now. We are simply alienated from the institutions of the state and we are now fighting a struggle to regain our political rights. The Tiger's greatest success has been in the north, in the Jaffna Peninsula. For nearly two years, they controlled the province, bottling up government forces in armed camps until the recent raids. They even ran their own television service, broadcasting speeches by their leaders.